to, uh, first of all, let you all know this is being streamed live on Facebook Live. So we all record it, so everything you say, a uh, candidate will be used against you. <laughs> but it's also to help us uh, get evidence as we continue uh, to push this issue. And my view of politics is that uh, everything seems impossible until it happens. Uh, so 15 years ago, I would tell you, hey, in 15 years, we're going to have gay marriage in 50 states, and a bunch of those states are going to be smoking weed. <laughs> you think it's crazy. Uh, that is what is happening right now. And so you just keep pushing. At some point, public sentiment breaks, and then amazing things happen. And I think uh, Abraham Lincoln had it right when he said that public sentiment is everything. Uh, with it, nothing can fail. Without it, nothing uh, can succeed. Uh, and so thank you to the UCLA School of Law uh, for hosting us here and for all of you for coming. Uh, some folks have asked me, how did I get interested in this year? Issue. How did gay conversion therapy become uh, a law? And so it happened that one day in 2011, I was just watching TV and I was flipping channels, and CNN had this interesting show going on. It was a documentary on the Sissy Boy Experience that was done right here at UCLA. And it was a federally funded program, and it was a crazy program. They would bring in kids, and they would basically do all sorts of strange and weird things to these kids try to make them, quote unquote, no longer sissies. So if you had a boy that was playing with girls' toys, they would, uh, parents were told to be mean to the kid, to ignore the kid, and the boy uh, did masculine type things, and so we praise the kid, and then they went and did additional, uh, completely outrageous things to these kids. And then at the end, they held up this one child, Kirk Murphy, and they said, he succeeded. He is no longer a sissy, he's normal and perfect and rational. And then later on, he committed suicide. This seems uh, quite evil to me. And uh, later on that year, I was uh, s sitting in my office, and uh, some LGBT groups came up to me and said, hey, there are these doctors uh, that are getting continuing legal, uh, continuing medical education credit uh, to uh, teach conversion therapy. We want to ban that. So I looked at it and thought, yes, we should ban that. But why don't we just ban the whole thing? Um, and so we embarked on doing that, and it was it was difficult. Uh, there was no press that was done in the very first committee hearing because we were afraid it would fail. Uh, we weren't sure what people would think of this. Uh, we, in fact, almost failed uh, in the first committee, uh, but we eventually did barely get it out. And then by the end of the process, people were like, oh, of course, we should fail this. It's evil, it's horrible. Uh, but it, it, it took a while. It took people like uh, James uh, here to my left who testified at uh, these committee hearings to really sort of show uh, the legislators uh, what a horrible, non-scientific, fraudulent practice covered in therapy was. Uh, so we got it signed into law, and very pleased, as all of you know, uh, earlier this month, Colorado became the 18th state to also ban conversion therapy for minors. Uh, I now have a federal bill, uh, the Therapeutic Fraud Prevention Act, that will ban it nationwide uh, for everyone and we'll be introducing it uh, later this month. And we have this amazing panel here that's gonna discuss uh, this issue uh, some more. And first up, I'm gonna introduce Matthew Shurka. Uh, he is the co-founder and chief strategist of Born Perfect Ending Conversion Therapy, which is a campaign created by the National Center for Lesbian Rights uh, to end conversion therapy in the United States. Uh, so Matthew, let's go ahead. Thank you, representative. Okay, it's working. Um, thank you so much for the introduction. Um, it's great to be here. Um, it's a, a huge honor. Um, and I'm gonna start, um, I'm just gonna start you kind of through like personal uh, experience. Uh, I'm 31 years old now, and I experienced conversion therapy for five years from age 16 to 21. And my parents, who grew up in a conservative neighborhood just outside of New York City, uh, didn't really know how to react when I came out to them. My father was, my father's reaction was just really loving, um, told me that not to worry and that he'd be by my side no matter what. And literally the following day, he began a search, um, speaking to different licensed professionals about what, how can he support his son and what does it mean to really be gay and all of his concerns of what would happen to me, myself, and our family. 
And a licensed professional told my father that there is no such thing as homosexuality. And that because I was 16 and young enough and not as sexually experienced that I could easily overcome my same-sex attraction, the acronym is SSA. Um, within six weeks, I should start to see my heterosexuality come back. And that was just the beginning of a five-year period. And I was actually brought to California um, and was treated here in the LA area for three of those years. And, you know, I can go into the theories of how they do this, but they, they just really believe that trauma is the source of anything LGBTQ, and that if you can treat the trauma, you'll overcome your same-sex attraction. Luckily for me, um, I did not have any specific traumas. I, I think I had a really great upbringing, um, normal, what normal, whatever normal means, um, a healthy upbringing. <laughs> and um, how I was diagnosed was I was too distant from my father, too close to my mother, and I had two older sisters. And in my treatment, I was separated um, and estranged from my mom and two sisters for three years. I wasn't allowed to, exactly. <laughs> um, I wasn't allowed to speak to them as a way of, of gender training. They wanted to make sure that I was a young man, understood that males are my peers and not, my, and not females. And then when I was ready to engage with females in romantically or sexually um, by the discretion of the therapist, they would deem when appropriate. Um, and it had a massive impact on my life and my relationship to my sisters and mom, of course. Um, you know, and if I look at my, if I look at who I was at school, I, I was I was a straight A student who was failing out of my classes. I thought it was working because I did become familiar with the boys at school. I did engage with women, and all on the false premise of living a double life when I knew that who I was was never really changing. And I contemplated suicide between two and three years. And I found myself in my early 20s as a very angry, resentful young man who was not in touch with my family. It's actually strange uh, from a family that never intended to even lose me. And seeking actual therapy, what a licensed professional does for the first time in my early 20s was my first experience in psychotherapy and overcoming the challenges and overcoming and undoing all of the conversion therapy, I came out at 23 years old and began advocating with the National Center for Lesbian Rights at age 24. And it was the same year um, Ted Lieu uh, drafted the very first elected official to draft legislation um, protecting LGBTQ minors from conversion therapy right here in California. Um, and soon after creating a more perfect campaign and. As, as Jocelyn said, really proud that we're now 18 states later um, with that model legislation. And what can I say <laughs> more than that? Um, yeah, I just um, want to acknowledge this particular piece of legislation and how vital it is. You know, if I look at my family, my family spent $35,000 on five years of my conversion therapy. And um, Representative Ted Lieu, who's been a champion for specifically consumer fraud issues, this is a consumer fraud piece of legislation. And it's an industry. It's an industry of licensed professionals who are claiming things that not a single university or college has in their curriculum that they teach it is not what has been reviewed by a single or approved by any single medical or mental health organization in this country. And um, I'm really proud to be introducing this bill again this year. You know, we're going to keep going. I'm really proud to be standing by your side. So, thank you. Thank you, Matthew. <laughs> thank you for sharing. Really appreciate it. Uh, next, I'm going to reintroduce uh, Jocelyn Samuels, the Executive Director of the Williams Institute. She's going to give us some background about the research uh, that the Institute has done on the effects of conversion therapy. Thank you so much, Congressman. Um, you know, I have uh, heard Matthew's story several times before, uh, and it never fails to grab me. Um, the emotional impact and the toll that this purported therapy takes on people is truly harmful to psychological health, to family ties, to self-deception, and it is a pleasure to be here to 
help participate in an effort to make sure that our young people are not subjected to this in the future. And for those of you who think that this is a boutique issue that you know, affects the people on this panel and no one else, the Williams Institute did research in January of 2018, which had never been done before, to identify the number of people across the country who have been subjected to this harmful practice. And what we discovered was, and this was in 2018, that number was 700,000 people, close to 700,698. Of whom 350,000 had been subjected to this therapy when they were adolescents. Formative years, when these were people who did not have control over their own destinies or over the treatment that they sought. We further estimated that 20,000 minors, adolescents, would be subject to the therapy in states that didn't then ban the practice, and that 57,000 teens would be subjected to it by religious and spiritual advisors. So this is not a small problem, and the individual costs and the costs to our health system are enormous. Now when we did the study, there were nine states and the District of Columbia, California first among them, that banned the practice. Now, as Matthew and the Congressman said, there are 18, and we're not done yet. There are bills pending in states across the country, and they take different forms. Many of them say that licensed medical providers are not allowed to provide conversion therapy as a condition of their medical licensing. Some of them are like the Therapeutic Fraud Prevention Act and say, you may not provide this therapy for money. It's a fraudulent business practice. Whatever form they take, they have been deeply impactful in protecting young people from this harmful practice. I will say, and I suspect that Casey and Tara, who you'll hear from soon, will say more about this, um, things are not entirely rosy, and we all have to be vigilant to make sure not only that states enact these bans and that Congress acts on the federal law, but also that we protect them from challenges. Because there have been challenges filed to the validity of these bans. Some of them say, it interferes with my free exercise of religion. Some of them say, it's a First Amendment free speech violation because it compels me to endorse a position I don't agree with. Early cases all rejected these claims and said, no, these bans are just fine, as is, I think, appropriate under the applicable laws. But there are increasing threats in the courts, and there are precedents that look like cases could come out the other way. And so ensuring that we all maintain awareness of the legal landscape and do everything we can to pass and defend these bans is really important going forward. So I'll stop there, but I'm so delighted to be here with all of you, and thanks again to Congressman Liu for his leadership on this issue. Uh, thank you, Jocelyn. Uh, next, I'd like to uh, uh, introduce uh, Kate McCobb. Uh, she is a survivor of conversion therapy to share her personal story, and really appreciate you being here today. Yes, thank you so much for having me. Um, so in 2005, uh, I was living in California and I started seeing a therapist, not to change my sexual orientation, um, but for reasons why you see a therapist. Um, I was struggling, I you know, was 25 at that time and I thought therapy could help with some of some of the things I was wrestling with. So I started seeing this therapist and pretty much immediately he focused on repressed sexual abuse. And um, he was very convinced that I had been sexually abused as a child and that recovering and 
processing these trauma memories were vital to my mental health. And to be completely transparent, I had always wondered if I had been sexually abused. And so even though you know, the very first time I ever saw him, he told me my mom sexually abused me, which was shocking. Um, but I kept seeing him and um, I would say those first six months to a year, he was very focused on me identifying and sort of accepting and recovering memories of sexual abuse. And then once, once I was pretty convinced I'd been sexually abused, which by the way, I, I was not sexually abused. Um, he told me that this was why I was lesbian. Um, he also knew I was lesbian from the very first time I ever saw him. I felt comfortable as a lesbian. Like I said, I did not have any intention to change my sexual orientation, but um, you know, he, he told me that I was lesbian because when I was a little girl, I had constructed a defense to protect me from the sexual abuse and um, that I, that that defense resulted in me thinking I was attracted to women. So first it's, you know, first it's about convincing me that I was traumatized and then it was about um, recovering from my trauma and, and what that involved. And at first it was growing out my hair, wearing dresses, hanging out more with females and doing female things, such as getting my nails done, um, talking about boys and men, and um, flirting with men. And slowly he started to also counsel me to um, date men. Um, he thought he was cutting edge neuroscience um, and would say things like if I, if I just stopped dating women, my attraction for women would go away. He said, um, this is actually a popular phrase in neuroscience, uh, use it or lose it. So if you, if you don't use certain neural networks, they will atrophy. And so I was told that if I just stopped dating women, then eventually my attraction to women would um, subside. I, I was also told that all romantic interactions that I had ever had with another woman um, were a reenactment of childhood sexual abuse. So that, that scared me really badly. And it was the last thing in the world that I would ever want to do with or to another person is reenact my childhood abuse. So I did follow his counsel and I did stop dating women for years and at one point, I even dated one of his male patients who he was convinced I was in love with. Um, there was a lot of, um, I saw him privately, but I also saw him in group therapy. And um, one of his male patients, he would say that, you know, he could feel the love between us from across the room. And that he, he told me that if I led with my head, that my heart would follow. Um, and I did date one of his male patients and it, it was awful. Um, <laughs> I, it, you know, I, it, it was kind of a breaking point for me um, in terms of doing this therapeutic work. I just, I, when I was trying to date, when I was dating this other patient of his, um, I, that's where I hit a point where I was like, I can't, I can't do this. Like, this is too much for me. Um, and I actually stopped dating this patient. And, um, about a year later, I, I stopped seeing this therapist, um, and moved to Oregon, um, 2015, very beginning. And, um, a year later, I contacted the NCLR. It, it took me a little while to realize that what I'd gone through was conversion therapy. But once I did, 
realized that um, I was pretty outraged and worked with the NCLR and we um, filed a lawsuit against my former therapist, which was settled in February. It was a consumer fraud lawsuit. Um, so that is, uh, I feel very, very proud of that. Um, so, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Kate, for sharing, for your courage and sharing doing that. We really appreciate it. Uh, next, uh, I'd like to introduce uh, James Gay, who is a marriage and family therapist who serves as the LGBTQ community, and he specializes in helping those who are subjected to conversion therapy. And thank you again for uh, helping uh, pass the first law in the nation to ban conversion therapy. So hi, I'm James Gay. I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist, and also a conversion therapy survivor. Um, I also have an affiliation with Center for Lesbian Rights, as many of us up here do, I'm a co-chair of their advisory committee for their Born Perfect campaign to end conversion therapy in the U.S. And uh, I'll be both speaking from my perspective as a recipient of this, um, again, in quotes, therapy, because it's really not therapy, um, and also as a therapist that's helped those that have gone through this experience deprogram from this cult-like experience. Uh, to find themselves and live their lives more authentically. Um, for myself, I went through conversion therapy as a 16-year-old. I grew up in a very conservative environment. My dad was a pastor. All I knew was that LGBTQ people would go to hell. <laughs> that's what I was told. That was, that's what I was brought up with. And so I actually volunteered to go, and it was still harmful. Um, you know. It, with faced with the decision to, you know, live an eternal damnation in hell or try and change myself, the, the option for me um, seemed simple. So I tried everything, you know, to, to do it through religious means, prayer, uh, going to um, any kind of sermon, childhood camp, anything at all, and it didn't work. And so I um, told my parents, and they sought out a licensed clinical psychologist. Um, to do this, and for the course of about every week for a year, I tried that. And I was also one of the youngest participants in ex-gay conferences, where they'd have workshops like, you know, how to uh, apply makeup for, you know, for for um, you know women identified um, participants there, or how to play baseball or coach it up for people like me, how to cross your leg, how to walk, you know, ridiculous things like that. Um, so I want to talk about uh, the common characteristics of conversion therapy. And you've heard some of them already here. You know, the most common form is talk therapy. And I just want to highlight that words can damage, right? Words can hurt, words can harm. And so even if it's not electric shock or aversion therapy or lobotomy of old, sort of mechanisms to try and change people, it's still incredibly harmful. And it is, you know, because they often use legitimate psychological theories and interventions for the purpose of trying to tell someone that who they are intrinsically, who we are, needs to change, that there's something that's ill, that, that there's some, some sort of sinful thing about it. These things are very much con connected to religious homophobia, biphobia, transphobia. Um, you really can't find a conversion therapist out there that doesn't have some sort of religious affiliation. So they're very much connected. Um, the, the key thing I wanna say about the harms of conversion therapy is that shame, right? A rejection of self is at the core of what creates these problems for people, right? It leads to things like anxiety, depression, suicidal ideation and actions, addictions to try and ease the, the tension, the noise that's within, um, relationship issues, all kinds of things. These are the things that we hear the most about with conversion therapy. But I also want to talk about the subtleties of other various harms that come from it. You know, when we are taught to be someone different than who we are, to limit our natural expression, of our intrinsic humanity. Um, 
it produces all kinds of symptoms like I just described, right? So it's the, the process of, of leaving this, of rejecting this sort of therapy and coming into our own is a multi-year, sometimes lifelong process of really finding a place of befriending ourselves, of having compassion for ourselves and our uniqueness and our diversity. Um, also, some of the common characteristics of conversion therapy, like you've heard, are uh, that we're, we're told to disidentify with the label being lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, or anything else, right? We're told that we um, are actually straight, but we just haven't reached our heterosexual potential. <laughs> Same is true for cisgender people, you know, uh, or transgender people. We haven't, you know, um, met our cisgender potential. Uh, the other thing is to uh, to find a root cause, as you heard Kate sort of describe. That oftentimes it's this hypnotic induction or direction to try and find something that may actually never exist in the first place, or to exaggerate any kind of disconnect with parents that might have been there growing up. And so, um, what you know, one of the harms from this can be developing false memory syndrome, right? Where we believe something happened. And we feel the trauma of that experience, even though it didn't actually occur. We, they also conflate sexual orientation with gender identity, as we've heard, which I've described. Um, so I just want to acknowledge that all the mental health professional organizations out there, in addition to the medical professional associations, have come out demonstratively against conversion therapy. They've said explicitly that it is ineffective and has serious potential harm for the kinds of things that we're talking about here at, on the panel. Um, so even though professional associations have said this, even though there's some bans across the country, conversion therapists continue to practice and create this harm. That's part of why this legislation is really necessary. So thanks again, Congress, Congress Committee, for doing this. Something James said, I just wanted to highlight when he said that words uh, can harm. And one of the arguments we make when we're doing this legislation is the way that therapists practice medicine is through speaking. And so if you were to say, well, that's protected by the First Amendment, then that would mean that no therapist could ever be sued for malpractice. And that was just wrong. No courts ever held that. And so the courts understood the argument that the practice of medicine takes a lot of forms. One is giving people a pill shock therapy, that's not really medicine, that's torture, but the, there are actions you take. There's also speaking as a form of practice of medicine, and that's uh, what the court basically upheld uh, one of the parts of the decision. So uh, thank you for making that, making that clear. Um, also, uh, we have next, I want to introduce Casey Pitt, a senior fellow for advocacy and government affairs of the Trevor Project. And Casey will discuss the emotional toll that conversion therapy takes and the resources available to those who have experienced it. Thank you very much, Congressman. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Casey Peck, and I serve as the Senior Fellow for Advocacy and Government Affairs for the Cover Project. I'm proud to be here today to express my organization's strong support for the Therapeutic Fraud Prevention Act and to offer our thanks to Congressman Liu for his outstanding leadership to protect Americans from this dangerous and discredited practice known, among other things, as conversion therapy. The Trevor Project is the world's largest suicide prevention and crisis intervention organization for LGBTQ young people. We work every day to save young lives by providing support through free and confidential suicide prevention and crisis intervention programs via our 24-7 phone lifeline, chat, and text platforms. And we also run Trevor Space, the world's largest safe space social networking site for LGBTQ youth, and operate education, research, and advocacy programs. This matters because by monitoring, analyzing, and evaluating the data obtained from these services, the Trump Project is able to conduct research regarding LGBTQ youth suicide and other issues that informs our position on state and federal policies to better the lives of the youth we serve. Uh, the findings of the Therapeutic Fraud Prevention Act, as introduced in the previous session, declares that the potential risks of conversion therapy are not only that it is ineffective, but also that it is substantially dangerous to an individual's mental and physical health, 
and has been shown to contribute to depression, self-harm, low self-esteem, family rejection, and suicide. At the Trevor Project, our direct experience with LGBTQ youth who contact us in crisis tells us that this is nothing less than absolute truth. Nationally, many of the young people we serve are survivors of conversion therapy or have a credible fear that their family members will compel them to go through conversion therapy. Supervisors for the Trevor Project's crisis services report that these issues come up regularly in conversation with youth coming to us for help, as often as weekly. These impressions are borne out by actual data collected on Trevor Lifeline, Trevor Text, and Trevor Chat, as our records show that in recent years, hundreds of contacts have reached out to the Trevor Project expressing specific concerns about this practice and terms like conversion therapy, reparative therapy, and ex-gay have appeared on our text-based platforms with disturbing frequency. Some of these LGBTQ youth contact us because their parents are actively threatening to send them to conversion therapy. Many talk about how they wish they could come out of the closet and be honest about who they are, but their fear of being sent to conversion therapy or to somebody who will try to fix them keeps them silent. Others call us because they are in conversion therapy, it is not working, and their feelings of isolation and failure contribute to suicidal thoughts and behaviors. We've had youth reach out to us because friends or loved ones are being subjected to conversion therapy, and they are desperate for a way to help them escape what seems like torture. And tragically, young people have come to the Trevor Project telling us that someone they know has died by suicide during or after being subjected to The Trevor Project is deeply invested in seeing an end to conversion therapy across the country through our 50 Bills, 50 States campaign because we know through direct experience and rigorous social science like that conducted by the Williams Institute and others that conversion therapy contributes to an increased likelihood of suicide attempts among the youth whose lives we fight to save every day. The Family Acceptance Project has found that lesbian, gay, and bisexual youth from highly rejecting families are more than eight times more likely to attempt suicide than youth from accepting families. Being subjected to conversion therapy is, unsurprisingly, a particularly extreme form of family rejection. A 2018 study by the same organization found that rates of attempted suicide by youth whose parents tried to change their sexual orientation were more than double the rate of youth who reported no such attempts. Suicide attempts for young people who reported both home-based efforts to change their sexual orientation by their parents and formal change efforts by professional therapists and or religious counselors were three times higher. Today, because of decades of effort by survivors and advocates like the people at this table, conversion therapy by licensed professionals on minors is prohibited prohibited in 18 states. The Therapeutic Fraud Prevention Act, by declaring conversion therapy to be the harmful and wholly ineffective fraud that it is, elevates that conversation to another level. Most importantly, this bill sends a clear message to LGBTQ youth in every part of this country that we know their sexual orientation and gender identity is real and valid, and that who they are deserves to be protected from the lie that they can or should be changed. Finally, having listened to this panel, this presentation, I know that even listening to this is hard and is challenging. And knowing that this is broadcast and that there are journalists in the room who will be writing about this, I strongly encourage that anybody who, hearing this, finds themselves in crisis, in pain, and needing an ear, please reach out to the Trevor Project. We're here for you. You can find our contact lines at thetrevorproject.org. Thank you. Thank you, Casey, for your testimony for everything that you and the Trevor Project does. Um, next, I'd like to introduce uh, Terry Russell Slavin, the Director of Policy and Community Building of the Los Angeles LGBT Center. And Terry will be speaking about what services the Los Angeles LGBT Center provides to those who have undergone conversion therapy. Thank you so much, Congressman, Congressman Liu, for all of your work in this area. Uh, again, my name is Tara Russell Slavin. I'm Director of Policy at the Los Angeles LGBT Center. We are the world's largest LGBT organization, and every month we have more than 42,000 client visits 
who receive comprehensive social services from more than 700 staff members. We are also celebrating our 50th anniversary this year, and unfortunately for all of those 50 years, we have seen the harmful effects of this type of conversion therapy on our community. Um, despite the progress in both social and political acceptance that we have received, we still today continue to receive numerous people who come in seeking services as a result of the barbaric and inhumane treatment that they experience at the hands of someone practicing conversion therapy. We regularly have clients who walk through our doors, often seeking services to address addiction, mental health challenges, including depression, lack of self-esteem, anxiety, domestic violence, and the list could go on. Underlying that trauma is having been subjected to conversion therapy. And thinking about what was earlier said, the trauma is not being LGBT, it's being rejected and being put through conversion therapy that is causing this harm. Often, we find that these people have started having been subjected to this practice in preteen through adulthood. Um, it's not uncommon for our youth to have been intentionally outed or sometimes unintentionally and accidentally and then be told you either fix this or get out. As an organization that assists um, hundreds if not thousands of LGBT homeless youth, that threat is real. Nearly 40% of all homeless youth are LGBT, vastly disproportionate, and we find in our services that 85% is linked to family rejection. Sometimes Conversion therapy comes at the hands of religious organizations or entities, and sometimes it's a conservative therapist in a small town or a large town like Los Angeles. We find that many people uh, have had this practice happen both here, in terms of California and Los Angeles, but also a number are coming across state lines, and that's part of why federal legislation is so imperative to address this challenge. Some of the examples we hear range broadly, from corrective rape to being brutally attacked to praying the gay away. In one case, a person who works at our organization who was married to a minister um, was sent to a therapist, and not unlike the stories that we've heard here, was told that she needed to, that she needed to change her sexual orientation and to do that to focus on a relationship with her mother. This, the damage to self-esteem in these cases is extreme and life-lasting. Uh, we provide services, and key for us is to making sure that the client who walks through our door seeks, is seeking non-judgmental LGBT-affirming care, whether it's counseling services, whether it's addiction recovery, whether it's domestic violence services, and that all of this is rooted in trauma-informed care. Uh, one of the programs we ha offer is including for survivors seeking safety, as a result of childhood trauma. I'll just add that the center has been committed to this issue for decades. Uh, we've supported legislation at the state level and the federal level, whether it be therapeutic, whether it be institutions for troubled teen industries, uh, that this has to stop both at the local and the national level. And we know that because if we are truly as a community going to thrive as healthy, equal, and complete, this practice needs to stop and it needs to stop now. So thank you, Congressman Lowe. Thank you, Tara, for your great work and your testimony. I uh, appreciate it. Uh, we're gonna uh, take some questions, uh, but first let me thank the people that helped put this on. I, I wanna thank uh, Dean Manukin of UCLA Law School for, for uh, opening this space for us. Uh, Ashley with the UCLA uh, Government Affairs uh, Office for uh, helping coordinate this and my amazing staff. Janet, uh, Aurelia, Daisy, Ryan, uh, as well as uh, Jenna. So uh, thank you for helping put this on and we'll open up any questions. Yes. So questions about our, our Vice President Pence and this issue. Uh, so I think because of all the pushback uh, that has happened on this issue, he has actually walked back, I think, some, some of what he said. 
and at least his people say that he doesn't mean what he said. <laughs> so I don't really know how clear he is on this issue, uh, but he clearly uh, is not out there saying, yes, we should do conversion therapy. Uh, so we'll see. We'll see if he makes any other statements on, on this issue. His initial statement could be read uh, to be interpreted as he supports conversion therapy. There is some ambiguity to that, so I don't exactly know exactly where he stands. I can add to that. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, he's, he has gone backwards on his public statement, but if you follow his money trail of donations, that's why we, a lot of LGBT, LGBTQ activists and people like myself still believe he is a supporter. Um, where he gives his speeches, like the Family Foundation and receiving donations um, from those specific groups that publicly do support conversion therapy and also publicly testify in opposition to these bills as we introduce them state by state, um, there's a clear alignment of where he is and those foundations are. Matthew, what do you think is the next state that go ahead and ban? Oh, wow. <laughs> um, you know, most legislative sessions have just ended and we had four states passing this year and we had a local ordinance passed um, yesterday here in Pennsylvania, um, which is great. That's the 52nd municipality in the country to do that. Um, Nebraska still has a bill pending, which is a really interesting state, um, just because of how conservative it is, and it's a single body legislative state. Um, Pennsylvania still has an opportunity because their legislative session goes until the fall. So I have my eye on Pennsylvania, Nebraska, Ohio, and Michigan. So if, yeah. Other, other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, so having introduced this legislation before um, and seeing it not pass, what was your strategy this time around to ensure that it has more success in passing? That, that's a great question. Uh, so I uh, introduced legislation. Can you repeat the question? Please? Oh, yeah. Um, so strategy for, for getting the therapeutic for operation act passed. Uh, so I've introduced this bill previously it was always in a Republican-controlled House of Representatives. Uh, so clearly there's a change. The American voters should have been controlled last November. So I feel uh, pretty good about getting this legislation passed uh, off the House floor. So as all of you know, the Equality Act was also recently passed by the House. Uh, that had bipartisan support. And so um, our view is we could get bipartisan support with this issue maybe even some more. And then we'll launch it to the Senate and then we'll see uh, what the Senate does. And like any other institution, the Senate also uh, responds to public sentiment. And so if now people rise up and say this is evil, crazy, and wrong, uh, they could also uh, pass it. I would echo just the bipartisan nature of the support for these bills in the states. Of the 18 states where we have passed legislation, seven of those bills were signed by Republican governors. And nearly every chamber that has passed these bills has done so with bipartisan support. One of the only exceptions to that was Hawaii, that literally has no Republicans. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? I don't know. Okay, so we'll stay here and answer individual questions. Thank you so much uh, for being here. Really appreciate it.